These five videos have explored the psychology of Michael Myers. And while Halloween 2 shows us the mother he sees, old Merrick worked out who the fatherly voice is that he's hearing. But it ain't about how hard you're hit. It's about how hard you can get hit. And keep moving forward. How much you can take. Talking to you. They keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. again. Laurie returns to the brackets and shouts out to anyone that can hear, basically Michael. I'm Michael Myers, sister! However, this self-knowledge brings her no greater wisdom, perhaps because she's processed herself as being his sister. That's more what she is rather than who she is, and frames her as belonging to him positioning herself relative to Michael rather than taking ownership of Michael as her brother. On discovering Annie, despite all the nightmares and lessons she might have learned from them, Laurie sends Mia downstairs alone, literally directing her into the kill zone, unprotected, unaware. Laurie's experience would tell her that where carnage exists, Michael will be close by. But she sends her friend off, a lamb to the slaughter, sacrificing this better, healthier version of her that could have been, had it not been for Halloween. It's almost like she's becoming his accomplice. Michael obliges, clearing away her last friend, ensuring there is only him left for her. He batters his way into the bathroom, but she's escaped out the house and into the dark forest. The same landscape he's now an expert in for tracking and pursuing prey. The agony visited on Sheriff Brackett seeing his daughter dead on the floor. It's reminiscent of Deborah Myers' discovering Judith's death. This is only the second time that we've seen the moment of first grieving for a loved one. Laurie gets to a road at the edge of the forestry, stopping a car. In not putting the facts that she now has together and in continuing to involve others, Laurie perpetuates the cycle of innocent people dying around her. In her nightmare, she was unable to communicate clearly the level of threat to Buddy, causing his death. She repeats the same mistake in reality. While she doesn't actively kill the driver, she's utterly unfocused in trying to prevent it. Another step on the road to full psychosis. Not protecting the innocent, as she tried to do in the first film. Michael kills him and overturns the car, then carries her from the burning wreck, fulfilling this part of the ritual from the previous Halloween. His mother leads the way to an abandoned barn. As Angel regains full consciousness, She's enveloped by her own delusions, which share common features with Michael's, namely her mother and a younger Michael. The younger Michael holds her down in her mind literally and metaphorically, because this is the Michael that she had an infant love for. The younger psychological Michael is the connection between Boo and Mum. The physical Michael stands to the side watching. He sees that she sees as he does. In the first film, Michael tries his best to connect with Boo, obeying the rules of connection in her world. Seeing the family photos in the Strode's residence, he takes her back to their home, lays her friend by Judith's gravestone, representing Judith, and shows her his photo. This didn't work, judging by the fact he got shot in the head. In this film, Michael pulls Boo across into his world. His acts trigger the entwining of their psychologies. A swirling wind and blinding celestial light mark the completion of his unholy mission. No, it's a helicopter light revealing the barn is surrounded. Loomis arrives once again, trying to make himself the center of attention he craves. Seeing this as the opportunity 
to turn himself from the villain he's made himself in the media into the hero he sees himself as. His presence fuels an attack by Brackett, who sees Loomis' greed as the reason for the situation. Well, this is not true. Michael's plan was irrelevant of the book's information. These are the thoughts of a grieving father. Blaming Loomis for exposing the relationship, as if the exposure is why Laurie has ended up in this mortal danger, doesn't account for the host of poor decisions made by the sheriff's department and bracket himself after that exposure. It's fair to say that realizing our own responsibility in the events of life takes time, if it happens at all. So Brackett can be forgiven for his reaction. Loomis decides to run to the barn, having convinced himself that this single act will recorrect the cosmic balance. Loomis enters, and we as the audience see Michael and Angel's co-delusion. Both Michael and Angel are controlled by the actions of that younger Michael on that Halloween 17 years ago. Michael is driven by the desire for family unity to make him whole again. He's given this desire total sanctity by expressing it as his mother's wish, making him the good son. Angel is striving to feel love, caring. That's why she's attacked those females in her life, accusing them of not caring and ulterior motives. She seeks a bond with a mother she only remembers in her subconscious to replace the mother Michael killed. The implication of Michael's spree two years earlier was that on the 1st of November, she woke up to find her family and her friends, except for Annie, had all been murdered. She lost her love and nurture network in a single night, which has haunted her ever since. She was left with the overconfident Annie, which explains her false conviction. I know Michael Myers is dead. That Michael wasn't coming back. In the director's cut, his mother says, <laughs> Michael smashes the psychic walls he's imprisoned himself in for 17 years by breaking the barn walls with Loomis's body. He kills Loomis because even though he's been free physically for two years, a part of him was still trapped in Smith's Grove. Breaking through the barn was his real escape. He also speaks. Why? I think it's because this is the first real crime of passion for him that isn't about detached control or re-establishing order. While Loomis has been insulting Michael on TV and in conference rooms, Michael didn't see it. However, Loomis has broken that doctor-patient trust, besmirched his family, and hurt his sister emotionally. And now, he's just shouting at her. In the first film, he spared him because Loomis showed respect and seemed to have her best interests at heart. But in this film, he can feel the embarrassment and hurt that Loomis has caused. He kills as a protective big brother, and that expresses itself differently. In this case, vocally. All through these films, the problem has come through not communicating at all. What we got here is failure to communicate. Throughout this film, his mother has been guiding him to break free of the mental walls that he placed around himself at Smith's Grove. Choosing to speak releases his self-imposed isolation because he now has family to go to. It's a simple word, but it accurately describes his desires and wants, explaining his action perfectly. This marks the completion of the arc for Michael Myers. He kills his father in line with the Oedipal complex that Loomis thinks he has, and in a macabre way, marks recovery of sorts. This allows him to face the world as an adult. And as an adult, he also answers for his acts immediately. As Michael is exposed to the police, not as the masked, impenetrable, unkillable killer, protected by the walls of darkness he's placed around his own mind, which give him superhuman abilities, 
but as just a man that's able to be killed, he ultimately is. His work is done. He's now brought out her repressed memories and they see the world with the same perspective. In the director's version, Laurie is shot for picking up the knife and moving toward a dead Loomis as Michael and Angel share a common enemy. The final scene is again in the mind. Angel sits on the bed in all white. Her mother and the white horse progress toward her. Perhaps this represents Angel's consciousness as she's lying there dying. Instead of being drawn towards the light of immortality, this represents her guide coming to take her home. Maybe it was just a cool shot that worked better for the theatrical ending of the film. So, what are these films about? I think it gives us a look at a more environmentally created evil. The first film shows us how evil was created in Michael, but the second film tracks its creation in Laurie, but poses a possibly hereditary element to the psychosis too. The most obvious place the evil presents is in the kills. But separate the kills from Michael Myers for a moment. If some of those kills were done by the Punisher or an X-rated Wolverine, we might be okay with them. The guards, the farmers, hell, maybe even Howard. This means that if we can accept killing in some cases, it challenges us as to where we draw the line. As with many of these horror films, we're reminded that malintent can hide in the shadows, waiting, planning. Evil does this by having a totally different perception of the world, allowing it to view time differently, with different priorities and following different rules. And this is possibly where the film separates itself. We see through the eyes of Michael himself. Halloween is the night where we remember the evil in the world. It's become a celebration of it, using humour and parody to make evil ridiculous, acceptable. The point of the Halloween films is to re-remember why we have the night. Evil is serious, real, man-made. We all make risk assessments about the threats that we might face. These films allow us to recalibrate our risk assessment models. Who amongst us doesn't check the doors are locked that night after watching? It also provides us in two hours with some useful truths. The state is a reactive force and a slow reacting force to threat and evil. The sheriff's department isn't in the prediction business. With limited resources, it always operates at a disadvantage. So for us in life, don't rely on the state for your safety. In a COVID world, this is particularly pertinent. As individuals, we will lose everything we hold dear if we underestimate or wrongly assess the size of the threat, so assess correctly. Basic risk assessment can be formulated as chance of happening times by impact if it did. We've all got a blind spot to the low likelihood but devastating impact threat because it requires a state of high alert and vigilance, which is the highest drain on emotional resource. The state focuses on high likelihood threats with devastating impact. If you speed, it's gonna be a problem. The individual is equipped to deal with the high likelihood threat with small impact. If you drink, you get drunk. These films shine a light on the unlikely but terrible threat. Its message is evil will take advantage of the oblivious and ill-prepared. Be petrified of your poor decisions. I think John Carpenter's Halloween had a message, beware the safe community feel of the suburbs. It's an illusion. Because when evil comes, whether in your home or even in a community pillar of safety, like a hospital, you're on your own. But Rob Zombie's Halloween wants us to fear something far more personal. The devastating consequences of being controlled by emotionally based decisions. And Halloween shows us that love, friendship, loyalty, sexual desire, that doesn't give us a special pass. 
How many people say they love, but do damaging things to those they love? Love is just a fuel for action, not a guarantee for right-mindedness. Michael was driven by love. He was just totally wrong-minded about how to express it. Here's some poor decisions and the emotions that led to them. Loomis doesn't really want to consider if Michael could be alive because he doesn't want to face that fear. Do the research. Brackett doesn't tell Laurie because he thinks he's protecting her. The truth will set you free. The driver tells the joke because he's trying to bond with his co-worker. Keep your eyes on the road. The farmers attack a man because they've got possessive love for their own land. Let it go. Who's leaving anyway? Howard bullies because his boss humiliated him moments before and he wants to nurture his own ego. Buddy, assess the situation. Don't mess with a seven foot shaggy haired behemoth with dead eyes. There's plenty of dumpster to go around. The boss posterizes a dead employee's tragic family circumstances for greed. Show some respect for a woman who turned up and did a shift while raising a family. Annie orders Andy to move your shitbox over there, Kojak, okay? <laughs> Don't make a federal case out of it. Turn out the goddamn gumballs. Because she feels invincible in her own home. Mike fooled you once, so shame on him, but he fooled you twice? <sighs> Learn to use a gun and carry it around with you like your dad if you think you're so tough. Mia wants to help her friend, but wanders around a crime scene oblivious to the fact the attacker might still be there. Get your mobile, go back to your friend. When Laurie gets to the road, she turns, collapses, and takes advantage of an innocent bystander dragging him into her mess. Get a better role model. No Alice Cooper and devil worshipping. You listen to Rocky. They keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. How did Laurie lose her mind? There's a nature argument. Angel suffers from the same mental illness Michael does, and this gene seems to be triggered by the extreme trauma of Michael's returns in Laurie. This does beg the question as to what was the potentially extreme trauma that a young Michael experienced that started this whole ball rolling. But as for another video, there's also a cosmic argument that Michael and Angel share a psychic connection. But the most compelling for me is the nurture argument. Angel was born and had her earliest experiences in that fateful house. Angel lost her sister and mother too. And while she might have been too young to consciously process this, just assuming she was too young for it to affect her and giving her to another family, meant the events and damage remained unprocessed in her. To the outside world, she'd look and behave normally, but that information unprocessed remained festering in a locked part of her mind. Michael's first return where he took her back to the house and taking her through another trauma experience within those walls unlocked that, bringing those events to the surface in her adult life. Her subconscious was trying to explain a truth that she hadn't yet realized to solve a future problem. Problem solving can feel like you're losing your mind, ending in either breakthrough or breakdown. Loomis, villain or red herring? He undoubtedly causes a lot of pain and becomes thoroughly unlikable. However, Loomis wasn't responsible for transporting the body. Loomis wasn't responsible for the lack of investigation into a severed head with Michael's fingerprints all over a bloodied shard of glass at the crash site. Loomis wasn't responsible for the silence over the slaughter at the rabbit in red. In fact, hold up, there was a crime scene so suspiciously similar to one that Michael left two years earlier, what with hanging human jack-o'-lantern and all. But apparently, Stripper Day Shift never reported it. Presumably just kept on dancing. No one even text 911 giving the police the heads up that the butcher of Haddonfield had paid a surprise visit. Punters just kept focused on the nipples. Should have added that as a fifth problem with the film. Loomis is not responsible. His actions, while unpalatable, were a red herring. The real villain of Halloween? While the visible evil is the kills, hence why on first watch, Michael's the villain, 
Zombies film showcases the evil of not communicating. Silence isn't golden in trauma. Silence is deadly. You know the phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. What if the man that appeared to be the do-gooder, the sole survivor, the biggest victim attracting all our sympathy, the man responsible for the decision to post a solitary cop with a shotgun to protect his only daughter from a killer, he thought might have survived four shots from a 357 Magnum, a fall from a first story balcony, and a vehicular crash two years before. A killer who, if he was coming, was likely to go to that man's house to find the sister that that man had taken away from him and was now providing bed and breakfast for. The man that was playing God and leaving babies in hospitals in other towns, disconnecting them from their past so they didn't know who they really were. Her brother wasn't dead. He was in an institution that he could have been eventually released from. The past always catches up with us. The number of people that are thrown into an identity turmoil when they find out that things aren't the way they thought they were, let alone their parents aren't their parents. The man ultimately responsible for the substandard investigation into the crash site. The man in charge of the police hostage situation, who didn't keep a tight perimeter and didn't order the lowering of weapons once Michael, the supposed perp, was shot. The man who didn't run over to Laurie, the hostage, with one of those foil blankets. The man who stayed silent, watching, waiting, the vital moment. Sheriff Brackett is perhaps the real villain. <laughs> Did Zombie do the old Scooby-Doo switcheroo on us? He holds more responsibility than anyone. Perhaps this is why he ends up with a villain level of punishment at the end. Having to live with the gruesome death of his daughter and the girl he was trying to help. But beyond his poor decisions regarding his own daughter and Laurie on that night that you might be able to forgive him for. Remember this. He sat there with Laurie in his house night after night for two years with all the pieces of the puzzle, watching her descend further and further, decaying in front of his eyes, aligning herself with the darkness, listening to her screaming in her sleep, desperately trying to work out, why me? Why did my life get turned inside out? While all the time he knew, and he just sat there, not saying a word.